Today on the Matt Wall Show, Elon Musk earns the wrath of the left once again for mocking preferred pronoun nonsense, but mockery and scorn is exactly what preferred pronouns deserve. Also, MSNBC declares that Brittany Griner's experience proves that black women are oppressed, but it doesn't it prove actually the opposite of that? Meanwhile, global weapons trafficker Victor Bout gives his first interview after being traded back to Russia and appears to love America more than the woman we traded for. Plus, Dr. Fauci speaks out about the danger children might pose to their grandparents this holiday season. A school board overwhelmingly votes against a candidate for school board president based on the fact that he's a cis white male. And in our daily cancellation, an Olive Garden manager is fired after going nuclear on employees who call out of work. I'm on the manager side on this one, maybe not surprisingly. All of that and more today on The Matt Walsh Show. Roe v. Wade has been overturned, and this battle is now finally leaving D.C. and going to the grassroots. No group in America is better positioned than 40 Days for Life. With about 1 million volunteers in 1,000 cities, 40 Days for Life holds peaceful vigils outside abortion facilities. They have a larger presence in blue states, with California being their largest state. Some former abortion facility directors say that these vigils can cause the abortion no-show rate to go as high as 75%, which is obviously detrimental to their abortion business, to say the least. These law-abiding vigils have closed many abortion businesses in America, and nearly half of those closed abortion facilities were in liberal cities where abortion will remain legal, uh, including uh, closures in San Francisco, Chicago, and Seattle. 40 Days for Life is effectively changing hearts and minds in the grassroots to end abortion. You can check out their locations, podcasts, and free magazine at 40daysforlife.com. And it's so crucial that you do because this fight for life is uh, far from over, and you've got to get invested. In order to do that, go to 40daysforlife.com. Over the weekend, Elon Musk appeared on stage with Dave Chappelle at a show in San Francisco. Now, um, I don't know for sure what's, what sort of reception Musk was expecting, but he's obviously a smart guy. So I'm assuming he was not surprised by the reaction he actually received, which uh, sounded like this. Ladies and gentlemen, make some noise for the richest man in the world. don't seem to like him very much. And if we were to watch the rest of that clip, we would hear Musk have a short exchange with Chappelle before shouting the famous Chappelle show line, I'm rich and walking off the stage, which is uh, certainly one way to handle this kind of situation and not a bad way either. Needless to say, there are, you know, um, few honors in life greater than being booed by a crowd of low IQ San Franciscans. The question though, is whether anyone in that crowd knew why they were booing. Now, they're, they're vaguely aware that Elon Musk is one of the guys they're supposed to hate. But if you were to stop them and conduct a poll, maybe as they left the stadium and, uh, and said, hey, what was that all about? Why, why do you guys hate him? Would they be able to explain their hatred? That seems pretty unlikely. They would not be able to articulate why they hate Elon Musk because their hatred is a reflex. It's a result of cultural conditioning. It's a sort of a tribal response against an outsider. All they know is that Musk has taken positions and conveyed ideas that do not follow the leftist orthodoxy. He's a mainstream figure who has gone off script. And not even that far off script. I mean, he, he could not by any measure be credibly described as right wing. Even if the media does describe him that way, he's certainly not. But any amount of improvisation, any attempt to think for oneself, especially by a mainstream figure, is apostasy in the minds of many people in the culture. Musk would continue uh, off script over the weekend, tweeting on early Sunday morning. Uh, he said, uh, he tweeted this, my pronouns are prosecute slash Fauci. Now, this was a fascinating experiment in some ways because the left had to choose 
whether to be primarily angry that he was mocking the high priest Fauci or that he was mocking LGBT dogma. Now, they could be angry about both, of course. They could be angry about many things all at once. It's perhaps their only skill, juggling multiple outrages. But the ensuing outrage cycle would have to revolve primarily around one or the other because that's the way outrage cycles work. And uh, it's no surprise that the LGBT desecration is what att attracted the most ire. Because on the left, you know, Fauci is a high priest, but LGBT people are deities. So even he must take a back seat in this kind of situation. There are many furious responses, uh, you know, accusing Musk of transphobia and homophobia and so on because he was making fun of the pronoun stuff. One of the responses um, drew an additional uh, uh, reply from Musk himself. Former astronaut Scott Kelly posted, quote, Elon, please don't mock and promote hate toward already marginalized and at risk of violence members of the LGBTQ plus community. They're, they are real people with real feelings. Furthermore, Dr. Fauci is a dedicated public servant whose sole motivation was saving lives. And to that, Musk replied, quote, I strongly disagree. Forcing your pronouns upon others when they didn't ask and implicitly ostracizing those who don't is neither good nor kind to anyone. As for Fauci, he lied to Congress and funded gain-of-function research that killed millions of people. Not awesome, in my opinion. Not awesome indeed. As for the rest of this, uh, I think there are two important points as we're having another uh, national discourse on pronouns. First, contrary to Scott Kelly's claims, LGBT people are not in the slightest bit marginalized. They are, in fact, the least marginalized people in the history of the human race. I don't think that there's ever been a demographic, a group of people, a quote-unquote community that has been less marginalized than LGBT people in modern America. Okay, and I can justify that based on the fact that when you, when you compare their percentages in the population to their influence and their representation in the culture— and the amount of over-the-top adulation and worship they receive, you quickly see that they belong to a very unique category. Entire months on the calendar are devoted to celebrating them. When's the last time a marginalized group in society had a month to themselves? Not just a month, not just one month, but months, and then weeks after that, and multiple days. They have their own flags, which are draped all over schools and government buildings. Every major corporation in the country bows at their feet. Celebrities go out of their way to identify themselves as members of this club. People are desperate to be a part of this marginalized community, so-called. And it's not because everyone likes to be marginalized. That's not, that's not the case. Like Throughout history, what you find is, is that in, in actual, when it comes to actually oppressed and marginalized groups in history, um, if anything, people are, are you know, uh, trying to present themselves as though they're not a part of that group, even if they are, because they don't want to be marginalized and oppressed. So why is everyone clamoring to be a part of this marginalized group? It's because everyone knows that the marginalization claim is total nonsense. Second, Elon Musk is right to mock the pronoun thing. This is what we need people in the mainstream to do. It's what we all need to be doing. Okay, Arguing against it is fine explaining your arguments about why you disagree with the pronoun stuff, but heaping pure mockery and scorn on the entire ritual is even better. Because that's what all this is. The exchanging of pronouns, the listing of pronouns, it is a ritual. It's a religious rite. It is a symbolic gesture meant to signal an individual's affirmation and assent to LGBT dogma. And it's spreading everywhere. This is not just a routine relegated to Twitter bios anymore. Schools and workplaces increasingly expect and demand participation in the uh, liturgy of pronouns. And they usually give reasons like tolerance and professionalism to justify the intrusion of preferred pronouns into these spaces. CBS News outlined the case in a recent article titled, Everything You Need to Know About Gender Pronouns at Work. And it begins by saying, It is increasingly common for professionals of all stripes to include a line in their digital signatures below their name or title, indicating what gender pronouns they use. That may read something like she, her, hers, or they, them, theirs, and specifics on how an individual wants to be addressed other than by their name. For some people who are gender non-binary or transgender, being misgendered can cause discomfort and anxiety. 
Quote, being misgendered is a dehumanizing experience. It's being reminded again and again that you don't exist as your gender in other people's eyes, said Cami Seitz Cherner, a co-founder of a tutoring cooperative who uses the pronouns they, them. Advocates stress how important it is that companies develop policies around personal pronoun use as part of their inclusion efforts, in part so LGBTQ people feel safe at work. More simply, it's a matter of respecting everyone in the workplace. But this, of course, is nonsense. This is not inclusion. This is not respect. This is forced conversion. It is the leftist version of, uh, if you can imagine, a secular school or workplace strongly encouraging students and employees to do the sign of the cross periodically throughout the day. This would not be a way of including Catholics. Okay, Catholics are already free to do the sign of the cross whenever they want. Pressuring others to engage in a symbolic ritual act which signals assent to a belief system that they don't even hold is not tolerance. It is, again, indoctrination. And in the case of the sign of the cross, such a policy would be considered wildly illegal, and any secular school or workplace that initiated it would be sued into oblivion. Pronouns are not treated the same way because they are uh, a symbol of the LGBT religion, which is now our unofficial and maybe eventually official state religion. This is why it's so necessary that we resist the pronoun garbage and mock it ruthlessly whenever we get the opportunity. People who demand that you adopt their belief system deserve nothing but scorn. And, and there is no neutral way to look at any of this. You know, The very concept of an individual having a pronoun, these are my pronouns, what are your pronouns, it's, it's nonsensical. Because in reality, nobody has pronouns. You can't have a pronoun any more than you can have a preposition or an adverb. The concept doesn't make any sense. Pronouns are not things that you can own. They're not like accessories. They are parts of speech. That's it. You don't get to customize them. So when someone asks you what your pronouns are, any attempt to sincerely answer the question is a concession that the question makes sense. It concedes that each individual gets to take possession of their own pronoun, which are dependent on their self-perception. So if, you, um, if you're a man and somebody asks you what your pronouns are, and you think that you're, you know, you're not participating in the game if you just tell them, well, my pronouns are he, him. Well, you actually are taking part in the game because you're not actually, in this exchange, the way the symbolism works, you're not actually declaring yourself to be a man. You're rather declaring that you perceive yourself to be a man. As if there's some sort of meaningful or relative or, or relevant or, or definitional distinction between what you are and what you perceive yourself to be. You, you are playing the game, whether you mean to or not. It's really no different than it's, when someone says, what are your pronouns? What they really ask you, what gender do you perceive yourself to be? That's what the question is. But if you just say man, then again, you're going along with it. The actual answer you want to give is like, what do you mean perceive myself? I am a man. That's, that's it. That's what I am. It's not about what I perceive myself to be. It's just simply what I am. So you have to re I reject the framing of that question. When it comes to pronouns, the appropriate response then to the question of what are your pronouns must be something along the lines of, that question makes no sense, leave me the hell alone. Or you can cut out the first sentence and just go right to the second. Either option works. Or come up with your own variation. As long as it's something that communicates your refusal to surrender to this madness and your contempt for the fact that it's being pushed on you to begin with. Now let's get to our five headlines. If you're listening to this show, odds are that you put a lot of stock into how you raise your kids. You understand that your children look to you to define their values and their perspectives of the world. That's why it's extremely important that you have a will in place. A will also determines how your financial assets are dispersed as well as your personal property. It lays out your health care power of attorney to ensure that your end-of-life decisions are carried out. If you're just starting out, you don't have thousands of dollars to spend on an attorney, but you want to make sure your savings, your belongings, and your family are all protected. You have to create your will at Epic Will. 
EpicWills.com today. Epic Wills early estate plans start at just $119, and you can save 10% when you use promo code Walsh. Go to EpicWill.com, use promo code Walsh to save 10% on Epic Will's complete will package. That's EpicWill.com, promo code Walsh. Well, I got to start here because we just knew that this was coming. Um, we, we, we knew it was, uh, it was, it was probably, not only is it coming, but it's probably going to come from MSNBC, and it did. So here's the, uh, the headline over the weekend. Brittany Griner is finally freed, but her peril is that of black women in America. Okay, now reading a little bit from this article on MSNBC. It says, when tennis star Serena Williams gave birth to her daughter in 2017, she nearly died because doctors did not believe her when she cried out in pain. As it turns out, Williams, the most famous athlete, the world's most famous athlete, it says, which I don't think that's true at all, that Serena Williams is the world's most famous athlete, but whatever, was uh, suffering from blood clots in her lungs. It would be hours before doctors agreed to do a CAT scan and rushed to break up the clotting before it reached her heart. Despite all of her prestige and achievements, Williams was at the mercy of a medical system that is uniquely fatal for black women. The state of powerlessness black women, including Serena Williams, are relegated to is a phenomenon sociologist and author Tressie McMillan Cotton discussed in her memoir, Thick and Other Essays. It supersedes even the most powerful status cultures in all of neoliberal capitalism, wealth and fame, Cotton wrote. The same can be said for American basketball player Brittany Griner, who has been sitting in a Russian prison cell for over five months for carrying 0.7 ounces of cannabis oil in her luggage. Cannabis from a vape cartridge, which her lawyer said she only brought to Russia by accident. Uh, Griner, the two-time Olympic gold medalist, WNBA champion, pleaded guilty to drug charges, the result of which could put her behind bars for up to, t- to 10 years. Now, as I'm reading this, you're, you're picking up on the fact that this is uh, a little bit, this is not exactly up to date. So this was written before she was released. It was written back in the summer. And then after she's released, released, it's repackaged and, and published again. And what makes that so funny is that the, the manner and circumstances of her release disprove the thesis of the article. So the, rather than putting an update and saying, well, forget about all this nonsense. We were actually wrong about this. Uh, rather than doing that, they're just they're just putting it out again, reasserting it. They were trying to position what's happening to Brittany Griner as, as somehow you know uh, it's it's uh, she's being uniquely victimized in some way because she's a black woman. And yet, this again is written in July, and then you fast forward a few months, and they 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 trade the most notorious global arms dealer in the world just for her. And they've got they got three people they could conceivably choose between her and then two white men, and they choose and they they trade just for her and leave the other two. And rather than the media like reassessing their uh, uh, you know claims that she was being uniquely victimized because she's a black woman, rather than doing that, they just go ahead and reassert it because it doesn't matter. As always, it's a it's an unfalsifiable theory. And no matter what happens, just like climate change, no matter what actually happens, it proves whatever they already believed. It's interesting, too, starting with this uh, anecdote about uh, Serena Williams. And, you know, as always, the, the focus on identity politics only ensures that you miss the point entirely. So the issue with Serena Williams, apparently, is that she was in pain and the doctors, I guess, weren't taking the pain seriously and then, uh, and that could have been very, very bad um, because they, they they weren't taking it seriously enough. And it turns out she had a blood clot in her lungs, which is a very bad situation. But they're they're trying to connect this to the fact that she's a black woman, um, which just it prevents the conversation from reaching any useful conclusions at all. Because of course, this is an issue that happens to anyone potentially when they're in the hospital. I went to, and this wasn't a, a potentially life-threatening situation, but when I busted my Achilles, I went, to the, I went to the hospital, went to the emergency room, totally busted Achilles, and I go there, and uh, they tell me that it's just a strain, and, uh, and then I ask, you know, it's the first time I left, I actually asked for, for pain medication. They wouldn't give it to me. They gave me, they said, well, just take some Tylenol. Go home and take some Tylenol, I'll put some ice on it. A week later, I go to a, a specialist, and they say, oh, yeah, it's, it's not a strain. It's completely busted. You're, you know, so suffering in a lot of pain for a week because of this. And now, I'm a white man, so I didn't have the, the marginalized identity to explain this. And so how do you explain it? Well, you know, from, from, the, from the, uh, the perspective of the, 
medical staff, you know, one thing is that they've got a lot of people coming in all the time, and sometimes they are exaggerating their pains, and sometimes they're doing that because they want the drugs and all that, so they're trying to balance these things. Doesn't make it okay, but it just means that, again, when you're trying to explain everything through identity politics, it makes you miss. It's a very, it's a very, it's a very narrow lens, and you're going to miss a lot of the picture. Uh, back to the Brittany Griner trade. Meanwhile, Representative Sheila Jackson Lee, you know, because uh, so, it's some Democrats, uh, they've spent time over the weekend doing some of the Sunday shows and some of the cable news shows, trying to explain why this was a good trade. And uh, here was Sheila Jackson Lee's attempt. As the facts would tell them, he was sentenced to 25 years. He saved, served 11 to 16 years. I don't know, the, I can't remember the exact number. But in actuality, um, his weapons might have been used to kill Americans. He has not killed Americans. I'm not saying he's not a nasty, bad guy. But I will tell you that I believe that Americans should know that the sovereignty of their nation will always be behind them and they'll never be forgotten. Hmm. Right. Unless you're Paul Whelan or, or Mark Vogel, right? We're still, still sitting in a, a prison cell. Uh, his weapons were used to kill Americans, but he didn't kill them. I, I wonder, and I don't, I don't have any clips to back this up, but I'm because I, I haven't looked it up. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna go out on a limb here, wild, crazy limb, and I'm gonna say that um, Sheila Jackson Lee, like every other Democrat on the national stage, has multiple times in her career blamed, you know, the NRA, um, gun rights advocates for mass shootings that they had no direct tie to whatsoever. So if you advocate for legal gun ownership and then a mass shooting happens, then it's effectively like you killed those people. And yet if you're Victor Bout and you actually give the weapons to the bad guys who are telling you, hey, I want to go kill Americans with this, and you sell them weapons and then they go kill them, well, it's like you didn't kill them, so it's not, it's not quite as bad. Speaking of Victor Bout, he himself, uh, again, the, the, the uh, arms trafficker, he did his first interview where he was surprisingly sympathetic to the United States. And um, this whole clip has been making the rounds online. Let's watch a little bit of it. Do you hate America? No. You know, in fact, I'm knowing many inmates. I figure out we're sharing way more common. Maybe America is... Very much similar. Look, it's the same size. They have a, it's the same kind of this. And when you talk to them, there is nothing there even to beef about. We are naturally, you know, born not to be enemies. And whenever there's conflict, it's elites. You know, every, you know, American I met in a prison who is from rural area was very easy to deal with. She has no problem with Russia. And he was curious about Russia, despite all propaganda. They're losing their Christian values. They're losing their families. They're losing literally their countries. It's not anymore the same country. We knew America, who used to be a model for entire world and lead and be an example, you know, like they say, a shiny town on the, you know, sparkling town on a hill. And this is, of course, pity. It was a strong country who was really a, you know, industrial might, you know, this one. And look, for 30, 40 years, deindustrialization, drug problem, crime waves. You can understand, and I feel more empathy to American after this experience than I would feel any hate. What would you consider as the most important event of the years that you have spent in prison? Uh, which events? Uh, international? Well, it doesn't matter. All right. Maybe international. 2014. It is quite, quite, quite sad that uh, the guy, the international arms smuggler who we traded back to Russia, appears, based on what he said, to love America more than the woman we traded for. Okay, th th those are sentiments that you're never going to hear from Brittany Griner. She wouldn't even be able to express it. 
both because she lacks the articulation required, but also because she just doesn't, she doesn't see America, though. She hates America. She really does. When you refuse to, when you say, I'm not going to go out into the court while the national anthem is played, that is, I mean, that can only be driven by pure scorn and resentment for your home country. You would never hear that from Brittany Griner. Instead, we hear from the from the Russian guy that we're trading, the guy that we're trading back to Russia. So we're we're sending away the person who loves America more and bringing in the person who hates America. Now, now look, uh, what you're hearing there, like there's a reason why they did the interview in English, right? Is this is this perhaps a ploy on the part of Russia? Is, is, is that is that an you know a part of this? That's probably the case. But even so, it's still quite sad that the woman we're bringing in would never say anything like that. And everything he said is is true. Whether he really believes any of that, I have no idea. But what he said is true. All right. Uh, Dr. Fauci over the weekend was, was asked about the dangers posed by, as we get into the holidays and people are worried about you know, the holidays and, and they're going to be around their families. It's a very terrifying prospect. So he's asked about the dangers posed by unvaccinated grandchildren. Listen to this. And with the holidays approaching, we've had lots of questions about safety of gathering with friends and family, especially if loved ones haven't been vaccinated. So Lucy from Maine asks, since we've been vaccinated, how dangerous is it to be near our grandchildren? They have not been vaccinated beyond what's required in the schools. Right. Well, vaccination, again, is the answer. So if you want to protect your grandchildren and vice versa, even though the grandchildren are not required to get vaccinated, if they are within the age, which is now six months six. or older, I would encourage their family. So if you are the grandparent, I would encourage my child, who is the parent of my grandchildren, to get their children vaccinated. Now, uh, needless to say, well, I guess maybe it's not needless to say it should be, but if you're bringing your kids in to get vaccinated, you're just a, a maniac, especially at this point. You know, there's, there, is, there was never any good reason for it, especially not now. Um, although, I also have to say, and I listened to that, to that and, and we, we hear from Lucy, whoever that is, that says, what, what danger, what danger is posed by, how dangerous is it to be around our grandchildren? And look, I know this does not apply to all older people. I, I, I realize that. But speaking in very general terms here, okay, for me, this speaks to one of the saddest things about the COVID panic. Uh, one, of the, one of the saddest things, one of the most pathetic, saddest, and disgraceful things it was not just that children were kept away from their grandparents. Okay, that was disgraceful. But also, and this is the part that people don't like to talk about quite as much, um, but also that so many grandparents went along with it and wanted it, you know, pushed it, pushed this. They pushed this separation. They, 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 they wanted that. We hear many stories about this. We all know, like anecdotally, you know, we hear stories from people in their own lives, and you know, they have, have grandparents. Say, I don't want to be around anyone in the family who's not vaccinated. It's just it it it's absolutely pathetic. And I would have hoped, you know, before all this happened, I would have thought that, especially when they started when they started telling us that you know kids are not allowed to be around their grandparents. I thought there would be an uprising of grandparents. I thought grandparents would be out in the lead of this thing and say, are you kidding me? You're going to try to keep me away from my grandkids? No way. You know, I've, I've lived a long life. I've lived a good life. I, I, I don't, you know, I've only got so much time left in the first place. Now you're trying to you know, rob my, my, my final days, my final years of, of, you know, the experience of being around my, my kids. I would rather be, I thought we would have Millions of grandparents saying, I would rather be dead than be isolated from my, from my family, from my grandchildren. Yes, I will risk my life, my life to see my grandchildren. If that's what you're telling me it is, which it isn't. Because, because kids were, they were never at a high risk of contracting COVID, also never at a high risk of spreading it. So it's never like you're risking your life to see your grandchildren. 
But I would have thought there'd be millions of grandparents that would say, I'm willing to risk my life to see them, even if that's what it is. I don't believe your, your, your hysterical propaganda, but I also don't care about it. Because if it's true, you know what? I'll take that risk. Yeah, I, I will risk my life to, to spend uh, a couple hours around my grandkids. I thought this was, and, and yes, there was certainly some grandparents that that, that was their view of things. And uh, when, when the uprising against the COVID, you know, the, the oppression in the name of COVID happened, there are many older people that were a part of it, but I'm, I'm again, talking in general terms. Um, there, so there's also a, a very common sentiment that we just heard from, you know, like, like we just heard from Sally. Is it dangerous to be around my grandkids? My God. For the sake of extending a life that you've already, not, not that your you know, life is less meaningful now just because you're older, certainly not the case, but you have lived a long life, and for the and for the for the sake of extending it, you know, isolate yourself from your family. You see your grandchildren as dangerous to you. What kind of life is that? And after all this time, to still have that attitude, I just can't even imagine that. I can't imagine being older, you know, whatever, being in your seventies or something, your eighties, and you've been isolated. You've isolated yourself for two years, and you're still not sick of it. There's just something, uh, there's something very, very sick about that. I don't mean physically sick. I mean spiritually, mentally. All right. This is from the Washington Examiner. A school board in Pennsylvania had voted eight to one this week against allowing one of their colleagues, Gregory Delia, uh, D- Delia, I guess, to become the president of the board because he is a cis white male. He is the uh, cis white male school board member, was supported by the Upper Moreland Democrats, when he ran in 2019, the father of three children, uh, attended Penn State and received a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering in 2005. According to a 2019 candidate questionnaire, he holds four U.S. patents and headed design and installation on uh, lines on the new One World Trade Center. His interest in the school board grew when one of his children struggled with school and was having a very bad experience. He was able to get the IEP, special education resources that his son needed. His goal in running for office uh, was to improve access to special services for students. Okay, so very qualified person is the point. And yet the school board um, voted against making this individual the president of the board because, yeah, all that might be true. He's got all those qualifications, but he has committed the the unpardonable sin of being a, quote, cis white male. So let's listen to that clip. Having said that, I believe that Mr. DeLeo would make an excellent president. However, I feel that electing the only cis white male on this board, president of this district, sends the wrong message to our community. A message that is contrary to what we as a board have been trying to accomplish. I think that it's important that we practice what we preach and that our words have strength when they are spoken, whether we speak them from the neighborhood sidewalks or from behind these tables. Mrs. Steinbeck has done an exemplary job as president these last few months, and the strength of her performance has earned her my vote tonight. Hmm. So all of that, they can never be, they go almost to the precipice of being somewhat honest about their intentions, and then they always pull back at the end. Because she said all she said all of that about, well, he's a cis white male, and so we can't vote for him. And, and, and then at the very end, after explaining that at the very end, she says, well, I voted for this other person because of the strength of her performance. No, that's not why. You just said, you just, you just admitted that you're voting for this other person because of her demographics and her identity. It's got nothing to do with her performance. And by the way, this, uh, this, this cis thing, you know, you want to talk about symbolic gestures that are meant to signal your assent to LGBT dogma. Uh, that's another one, using the term cis. And they're being used by a woman who, I don't know how old she looks, she's in her 40s or 50s at least, which, which just tells me that she, she's gone the majority of her life never using that, that term cis. 
and just over the last couple of years has started in injecting it into our vocabulary. And what is cis supposed to? When you say someone's a cis white male, it's supposed to, you know, a cis is someone who is not transgender, who identifies as their actual biological gender. The whole point of calling someone cis is to, is to make it seem like being a, just being a, a normal man who sees yourself as a man, making it seem like that's just one potential variation. You know, there are many variations on being a man, and cis is just one of them. And then there's also trans, and there's, there's non-binary. Even by using the term cis, you're basically taking everyone. That's just a way, that's a way of taking, it's like this forced baptism of, of everyone. And in the end, you force everyone under the LGBT umbrella. Because that is an LGBT term. Um, and all of that to say that they can't vote for this guy because of his, because of his race and his sexuality. Which just goes to show, once again, that we talked about marginalized groups. Well, in reality, uh, the most marginalized group in America, heterosexual white males. There's just no way around it. And, you know, the only thing, whenever you make a claim like this, the only thing the left can do in response is just scoff at it. That's ridiculous. White males. But they can't explain why you're wrong. Because they know, of course, you're right. And they know that you take that clip. And you have her explaining why they can't make someone school board president um, because of their identity and make it any identity other than straight white male. And this is a national scandal. Everyone on that school board is getting fired and they're probably going to be criminally prosecuted. Can you imagine if it was uh, if it was the exact same conversation and except instead she said, well, you know, Dalia is uh, unfortunately he's a he's a gay black man. Very qualified, but he's a gay black man. So it would send the wrong message to make a gay black man the president of the school board. If she said that, she's going to prison for that. She's going, she's actually, that's a hate crime. She's going to jail. The only group you could possibly get away with saying that about would be straight white men. All right. And you also see the reverse happening here, right? We're, we're, so we talked about with LGBT, you have their percentage in the population, which is still quite small, although it's growing all the while because they're recruiting and indoctrinating children into this cult. But um, still, it's still a, a, a small minority of the population. You can you, you compare their percentage to the, the amount of representation and coddling and celebration that happens in the culture. It's wildly out of balance. And it's the reverse for straight white men. There's a lot of straight white men in the country, but um, increasingly you don't see them in the commercials. You don't see them in shows. You, don't, like, you know, they're certainly not celebrated. You're not allowed to do that. You are not allowed to express any specific appreciation for. You are not allowed to say, you know, I appreciate uh, everything that straight white men are doing for our culture. You're not allowed to say that. You cannot say it. I mean, I'm saying it, but. If you care about having any kind of mainstream approval and acceptance, you can't say it. All right. What else do we got here? I wanted to play this for you, too. Here's a teacher explaining why parents should just shut up and let the school system sexually indoctrinate their children. Here's what she says. I have a thought. Now, I know the trolls are going to be like, uh-oh, she should have stopped there. But I'm not going to do that. So there's a lot of controversy about... Um, whether or not sex education, health education, relationships, gender, all that stuff should be taught in the classroom. Here's what I think. You, you as in parents, send their kids to school to learn math, reading, writing, history, science from a professional, right? But in the same token, a lot of people who do that also think that they're experts in sexuality education because they've had kids. With all due respect, just because you've had kids does not mean that you are a sexuality education expert. It does not mean you are an expert in sex. It does not mean you are an expert in the body. It does not mean you are an expert in gender. It does not mean you are an expert in relationships. So the same way that we're sending our kids to school to learn these skills, these life skills like math and quadratic equations and calculus and whatever else from a professional, we also need to be ensuring that our students are learning information about their health, about identity, about very complex issues from a professional. 
I mean, like, it, it makes sense. It makes sense. Okay, well, if you say it makes sense, then that's, well, that's, that is an argument that I just cannot, uh, she's, she's, that's it. It makes sense. They need to learn from like a professional. It makes sense. Well, okay, if you say so. Of course, it doesn't make sense at all. It doesn't make sense on multiple levels. Um, the first being, you know, even if the school is staffed with experts on sexuality, whatever the hell that means, um, that still would not make it, you still have not explained why it's appropriate, why the school is a place for those kinds of conversations. If there could be something such as a human sexuality expert, um, you still have not explained why we're putting them in schools and how it could possibly be appropriate to have those conversations with an eight-year-old because it's not. The school's not the place for that. Um, just because the kids are there it doesn't mean that you are justified in uh, just talking to them about whatever you want to talk to them about. But then also, um, teachers are not experts in these subjects. You don't need to be on any, you don't need to be a subject matter expert on any subject to teach you in a public school system. You don't. Like the people that are teaching mathematics to, to, to sixth graders, these are not these are not expert mathematicians. And the you know reality is that if if they were, they probably wouldn't. You know, it's like it's a cliche, but those who uh, can't do teach, and there's like some truth to that. It's not always the case, but oftentimes it is. You know, if you're an actual scientific expert, you're probably not teaching science in third grade. And I got a lot of respect for people who teach science in third grade, but it's not that you're not a you're not a scientific genius necessarily just because you're doing that. And that's especially the case when it comes to uh, sexuality. These are not experts in these subjects. Again, even if they were wildly inappropriate, grotesque, abusive to be having these conversations to little kids with little kids in a, in a, a school system. But they're also not experts in that. Yeah, just the fact, and this is something maybe the left doesn't understand. Just because you're a, a, a deviant, you're, you're, you're like a sex-obsessed deviant, and you have lots of different kinds of sexual encounters, it doesn't make you a sexuality expert. If anything, it's quite the opposite. Because you're so consumed by your own deviancy, your own perverse desires, your own fetishes, that you couldn't possibly be an expert. You, you, you can't think objectively about this. You're just, you're just, you're, uh, you're consumed by it mentally and spiritually. Again, certainly not an expert. All right, let's get to the comment section. It may be the season of giving, but you've already given enough to your internet service provider if you haven't been using ExpressVPN every time you go online. When you go online without ExpressVPN, your provider like AT&T or Verizon or whoever it is can see every single website that you visit, and they're legally allowed to sell your browsing history to third-party advertisers for massive profits. Stop giving away free information to your internet service provider and start using ExpressVPN Today, ExpressVPN encrypts and reroutes 100% of your network data through their secure servers so your provider can't see a thing. It sounds complicated, but ExpressVPN is actually incredibly easy to use. Just fire up the app on whatever device you're uh, using, phone, laptop, whatever it is, and tap one button to connect, and that's all you got to do. You've given enough to your ISP this year. Take back your internet privacy today with the number one rated VPN by TechRadar and Mashable. Visit expressvpn.com slash Walsh and get three extra months of ExpressVPN for free. That's expressvpn.com slash Walsh to get an extra three months free. Expressvpn.com slash Walsh. All right. You know, one of the one of the good things about having kids is uh, is they keep is it really they do keep you humble and it's always a nice ego check. So we took uh, took the family to here in Nashville, it's the Gaylord uh, Opryland uh, Resort, and they they do um, they have this whole winter Christmas Wonderland thing they do every single year, and you go and there's like different ice you know different uh, winter related activities, including ice skating. So we went there, 
And uh, I think I've, I've gone ice skating maybe twice in my life. And, uh, but in this case, you know, the kids wanted to go ice skating and they didn't want to be out on the ice alone. My wife obviously can't go because she, she's pregnant. So I said, okay, I'll go, I'll go out there. I'll put the ice skates on. I'll go out and skate with you guys. And I did. And uh, I, I didn't fall. I, was, I, th- I actually thought I, I did very well. You know, I was proud of myself. I was skating around with the kids. And I thought, well, like, I'm pretty good at this. I'm actually a natural. I might get into hockey or something. This is, wow, I am good at this. And then on my way, on the way home, um, and I was still, you know, thinking about what a good skater I am. My son says to me, because my youngest son who didn't want to go skating, so he was sitting with my wife and like watching us. And uh, he says, Daddy, you look funny out there. You look like a penguin out on the ice. I said, oh, thanks. Because you were waddling. Yeah, thanks. You looked really funny. Yeah, I got it. Thank you. So I thought I looked great, but apparently I was humiliating myself the whole time. Joke's on you, though, because penguins are very gifted on the ice. So I take that as a compliment. Um, this from Lil One says, I'm a black woman, and I think it's ultra ridiculous that they traded a gay weed smoker for a Russian arm dealer, arms dealer in the middle of a Russian war. That is ridiculous, and that's, you know, you don't need to be any particular identity to see the absurdity of this. Lauren the Wolf says, the issue is not that we are treating weird as normal. It's that we're treating sin as virtue. Yeah, I think uh, I don't think it has to be either or, Lauren. I think it's a false choice. I think it's I think the issue is both. Yeah, we are treating sin as virtue. And when we talk about virtue signaling, so I've never I use the phrase because we all kind of know what it means, what we're referring to. But uh, it's virtue signaling is actually vice vir- uh, signaling. It's 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 sin signaling. The things that are being signaled are never actually virtues. So that is the problem in the culture, but it is all, it is also the, the, uh, we have this attack on normalcy. Like we're conditioning people, especially kids to believe that normal doesn't exist. There's no such thing as normal or even that normal is bad. You don't want to be normal. Um, and so I think both are happening. Let's see. Summer says, am I the only one who has become increasingly more frustrated every time someone says that she, Brittany Griner, was wrongfully detained? She broke the law and got caught. What am I missing? Yeah, she wasn't wrongfully detained. I mean, the, the, the sentence of whatever, I forget what the sentence was supposed to be, but many years in you know, forced, a forced labor camp for having a vape cartridge, I think we can agree that that's a, an overly harsh, and I'm all about law and order. Uh, I don't think I would advocate for... Th- for that in this country. Now, I do advocate for uh, for labor camps for prisoners. I think we should go back to that. But uh, uh, I don't think I'd give you 10 years in f- of forced labor because you had a vape cartridge. But she did break the law and she was detained for that the same way that any of us would be. Including, by the way, in, in American airports. If you try to go through an American airport with, with drug paraphernalia... You're going to get arrested for that. You get arrested for a lot less than that in an American airport. So I think you're right. Uh, Sam says, hi, Matt. Last week, a coworker actually confided in me that his two children are experiencing a lot of anxiety about the climate crisis. First time I've ever encountered that level of wokeness in the wild. Apparently, it's not all just on Twitter. That's It is absolutely not just on Twitter. Just like with the pronouns, it's uh, some of this stuff might... In some ways, you know, uh, social media is a, a, a vector for this. Um, this is how it spreads, but it is out in society as well, including for, the, for uh, you know, cl- kids having climate anxiety, which will never fail to infuriate me when I hear about that. Because there's, you know, kids are not coming up with that on their own, okay? A child is not going to walk outside in the summertime and just on his own come up with this idea that, well, this signals that the ice caps are going to melt, we're all going to drown. He has to be told that. So we are, we are giving this anxiety to children, which, by the way, even if it was true that we're on the verge of planetary extinction because of climate change, which it isn't, but even if it was, it would still be unthinkable to put that on a child. What's he going to do with that? 
aside from be plagued by anxiety with apparently the very few years we all have left. Well, it was a big year for me personally. I made my first TV appearance on Dr. Phil, which uh, led up to the release of my documentary, What is a Woman, that exposed the effects of corrosive gender ideology. I also held the rally to end child mutilation, which is leading to very real actions on the part of Tennessee legislators. All this was accomplished despite the wicked forces that are trying to silence me and all of us here at the Daily Wire. And all of this was accomplished largely in part because of those of you who join the fight. And uh, I thank you for that, but we need more support. This holiday season, you can save 30% on new Daily Wire Plus annual memberships and gift memberships when you use code HOLIDAY at checkout. If you're already a member, well, thank you for that. And if you're not yet a member, now is the time to join. Uh, look, 2022 was huge, but I have much more planned in the future that you're not going to want to miss. So go to dailywire.com slash Walsh, use code HOLIDAY at checkout to get 30% off New Daily Wire Plus memberships. That's dailywire.com slash Walsh today. Now let's get to our daily cancellation. Now this may surprise you, but I'm going to disagree with the majority opinion about something. Um, I don't think of myself as a contrarian, contrary to what most people say about me, but on this I must dissent. A manager in Olive Garden in Kansas has been fired after sending an angry email to employees telling them that they may not call out of work for any reason. And if they claim that their dog died as an excuse for coming to work, they have to bring the dead dog in as proof. Now, the manager, whose name has not been published, thankfully, was fired. And, and most people have applauded the decision after the email went viral. But I'm on the manager side of this. And I'll explain why. But first, here's the story from a local CBS affiliate. It says a, a Johnson County restaurant manager sent a harsh message to employees about taking time off and was subsequently fired. An Olive Garden media relations representative confirmed to KCTV5, uh, a manager at the restaurant on 95th Street, sent the below message to staffers. And here is the message in full. This is what it says. Quote, our call-offs are occurring at a staggering rate. From now on, if you call off, you might as well go out and look for another job. We are no longer tolerating any excuse for calling off. If you're sick, you need to come prove it to us. If your dog died, you need to bring him in and prove it to us. If it's a family emergency and you can't say, too bad, go work somewhere else. If you only want morning shifts, too bad, go work at a bank. If anyone from here on out calls out more than once in the next 30 days, you will not have a job. Do you know in my 11 and a half years at, at uh, Darden how many times I called off? Zero. I came in sick. I got in a wreck literally on my way to work one time. Airbags went off and my car was totaled. But you know what? I made it there on time. There are no excuses. Us collectively as a management team have had enough. If you don't want to work here, don't. It's as simple as that. If you're here and want, and want to work, then work. No more complaining about not being cut or not being able to leave early. If you're in the restaurant business, do you think I, I want to be here until midnight on Friday and Saturday? No, I'd much rather be at home with my husband and dog going to the movies or seeing family, but I don't. I'm dedicated to being here, as should you. No more excuses or complaints. I hope you choose to continue to work here, and I think we, the management, make it as easy as we can on y'all. Thank you for your time, and thank you uh, to those who come and work every to work every day and work hard. I wish there were more like you. Okay, as a message, Olive Garden announced that it had parted ways with the manager after uh, this was released. It was a predictable decision, but the wrong one. Now, obviously, there's some hyperbole there. You shouldn't actually bring a dead dog into a restaurant. This is Olive Garden not Panda Express, for God's sake. And of course, it's conceivable that a person could have a reason to call out more than once in a 30-day period. I rarely call in sick to work, but I, I missed an entire week, uh, entire week a few months ago after I lost my voice. Not a lot I can do without a voice. Though even then, I still dragged myself to work and I recorded a segment in subtitles. That's how committed I am to my job. Or it's how committed I am to trolling. You decide. Perhaps there's not much difference between the two. At any rate, the point is that there, there, there is reason to object to this manager's message to employees if you insist on taking it absolutely literally. But a more charitable interpretation is that this person is trying to run a restaurant and yet is sabotaged every step of the way by spoiled, entitled brats who want a paycheck but don't want to put the work in to earn it. And these are frustrations shared by a great many managers in the restaurant and retail space and other industri industries. Call-outs and no-shows are at an all-time high. And it's not because everyone's dogs are dying all of a sudden. It's not because there's a record number of family emergencies. Uh, if, it's a, if it's a medical emergency driving this problem, the, the medical emergency is a, is a severe allergy to hard work, I think is the, that's the real epidemic happening here. This is an affliction which has spread across an entire generation and beyond. 
And the people who are trying desperately to keep our economy afloat by keeping these businesses open, they're fed up and they're furious. And they should be. If I was in charge of Olive Garden, I wouldn't fire that manager. I'd give him, I, I'd give him a raise and a promotion. Because this is exactly the no-nonsense, get-your-crap-together attitude that we need. Now, of course, there is another side to the story. I made a condensed version of the point I just articulated on Twitter over the weekend, and Lauren Southern responded, disagreeing with me, saying, quote, people are fed up working jobs with no upward mobility, no living wage, thanks to inflation, and no real benefit to their community, multinational corporations. Workers don't care anymore because a manager that asks you to bring your dead dog in clearly doesn't care about them either. Now, Lauren and I went back and forth several times, and um, although this breaks the rules of arguments on the internet, we still respected and appreciated each other by the end of it. Um, I've been a fan of Lauren's for a long time and still am. And she raises an important point here, which, which I don't fundamentally disagree with. It's true that many people are disillusioned and demoralized, and they have no hope. They, they're dropping out of a system that they feel is rigged against them. So she's right about that. And I made a similar point, or at least a related point, in one of my uh, monologues last week. It's an important aspect of this problem, and, and it's important that we talk about it. But there are other realities which also must be acknowledged. Because this is not a simple matter of the working class rising up against their wealthy oppressors. The people left holding the bag here, such as managers at Olive Garden, they're working class too. And, and it's worth sticking up for them. And, and on that note, a few points. First, many of the workers who are giving up and throwing in the towel are young, okay, like late teens, early 20s. These are not people who've been grinding it out for years and years and have finally become exhausted by it. Most of the shift workers at Olive Garden, they are, they are not going to be people in their 50s who've been slaving away for decades only to have their opportunities for greater success stolen away by various misfortunes and calamities out of their control. There may certainly be some people in that category, but a greater number are young adults in college or just out of college uh, or, or who never went to college but are around that same age. And if you're in this, this demographic and you've already stopped trying, that's a whole lot less understandable because you never started trying. You can't be fed up with something that you've never even done. You're in your early 20s. How do you think life is supposed to go for you at that age? Do you think you're supposed to enter adulthood and immediately be rewarded with the kind of wealth and fortune and job security that most people work decades to attain? What, what did you expect? Working at Olive Garden sucks. Of course it does. Of course it does. No one ever said it doesn't. There's no version of working at Olive Garden that won't suck. But you got to start somewhere. You got to pay your dues. You have to work your way towards whatever it is you want. It's, it's not going to be handed to you. A very small fraction of human beings in the history of the world have been born so wealthy that they never have to work for anything in their lives. But if you, like me, are not in that category, then there is no option but to build for yourself whatever kind of life you want. Or rather, there is no other respectable, honorable option. Unfortunately, our society does provide the option of coasting by, living off of the very system you pretend to oppose while profiting from the work done by others. And as I've often preached, you know, life requires work. Life is work. I wish it wasn't that way. But it is. The only question is whether you will do the work necessary to sustain your own existence, or if you'll find a way to force someone else to do it for you. Door number two was never available to most humans who have lived on the planet. But it is available for us. Okay, because as it turns out, the system that really controls things, this is what they want. They want you to be a lazy good for nothing, just coasting through life with no ambition, no, no real desires, no plan, nothing. They want you to be satisfied with being merely uh, fed and distracted. That's what they want. So they've made this option available to us. And you think you could protest that system by doing exactly what they want, by becoming the sort of person they want you to be, which is like a non-person, a non-entity, just a big nothing who does nothing and, and, and it, it contributes nothing at all to the world? So if you walk through that door, you will be entering into a life of mere existence, mere satiation. You will not find success. You will not find dignity. 
You will not find joy. And most of all, if you take door number two, you cannot pretend that you're above it all, that you're fed up with the grind, that you found a more enlightened way to live. That's not the case because you're still very much dependent on those who are in the grind, those who are doing what you will not do and are now forced to work even harder just to subsidize you. You notice that there's employees at the Olive Garden that don't want to put the work in. They still want the paycheck, right? But in order to have a paycheck, this, this restaurant needs to stay open, needs to exist. And they don't want to contribute much to making that happen. But they need someone to do it. Right? They need, they need enough people there at Olive Garden to keep that damn place open so that they can keep, keep getting the paycheck they want. So they are just... They are just uh, handing off all of those responsibilities to someone else, having someone else do it for them. Someone else who is also working class, someone else who is also not wealthy. They're not passing it off to the CEO of Olive Garden. You're passing it off to the other, to just whoever there at Olive Garden, to whatever patsy you can find to do the work that you won't do. Because in the end, you must work. You don't have to like it. You don't have to think it's fair. But if you wish to keep your dignity and the moral high ground or any moral ground at all, there is no other option. Some people understand this, like the Olive Garden manager, and they live accordingly. And so often the ones who do the work only get insult to add to injury time and time again. They become the bad guy. They're doing everything. They're the only reason that these good for nothings have a freaking paycheck to begin with. And they end up the bad guys. Not in this segment, anyway. That's why it is not the Olive Garden manager who is canceled, but the lazy employees with their fake dead dogs and made-up sick family members. They are the ones who are today canceled. And that'll do it for this portion of the show. Let's move over to the members block. Thanks for, uh, hope to see you there. If not, talk to you tomorrow. Godspeed.